Hello everyone, welcome to today's lecture. Today our topic is on some negative cultural practices that hinders development. Before we move in, let's look at what culture is. In simple terms, culture refers to the total way of life of a group of people. It includes their way of dressing, their food, their philosophy, their religion, their language. Anything that comes together to form the way of life of a group of people is referred to as culture. According to E.B. Tyler, culture denotes the totality of a people, their thoughts about life, their learned and shared patterns of behavior, as well as their understanding concerning the meaning of judgments on the value of things, ideas, emotions, and actions. Culture can be expressed in two ways. Or we can say there are two aspects of culture, the tangible aspects and the intangible aspect. The tangible aspect of culture refers to that aspect of culture that is visible. It can be seen, felt, and touched. Examples include the dressing, the food, the technology, the architecture, the visual arts and symbols. All of that forms the tangible aspect of culture. The intangible aspect of culture refers to that aspect of culture that cannot be seen, felt, or touched. So it includes the language, the philosophies, the ideas, the morals, the beliefs, the folklore, language, and among others. Culture is learned, but not inherited. Culture, they say, is learned or acquired, but not inherited. This means that people are not born with their culture. Rather, they are taught their culture. That is why people move from places to places and they are able to learn the culture of a particular group of people they find themselves with. And then they live according to the culture of that people. In the same way, culture is also shared. Culture is shared. There is the sharing of culture between people, between societies. That is why you find an Akan man whose favorite food is Tiozafi. Even though Tiozafi is not an Akan delicacy, you find a Gan man whose favorite food is fufu. The Gan's traditional meal is not fufu, but kinky. You find an Asante man wearing smock. In today's world, you find Ghanaians dressed like Nigerians or dressed like Indians. Some cultural practices have been branded as negative. There are some cultural practices that people see are very positive and are even advocacy for its continuous upholdment in our contemporary societies. However, there are others that are tagged as negative, and the reason why these cultural practices are tagged as negative is because they infringe on the human rights of the people who practice them. So today we are going to look at some of these negative cultural practices and see how they infringe on the human rights of the people who practice them. The first to be discussed is Trokosi system. In Africa, you, you can find the practice of Trokosi in countries like Benin, Togo, Nigeria, and Ghana. In Ghana, the word Trokosi is an ever word. It is a combination of two ever words. Tro, which means deity, and then Kosi, which means slave. So literally, Trokosi means slave of a deity, deity slave, or slave to a deity. In Trokosi system, what happens is that a girl is sent and served in the shrine of a deity as a way of atoning for the sins of a relative. So for instance, Akosia's mother commits adultery and the punishment Akosia's mother is supposed to face is banishment or sentence to death or whatever. To prevent Akosia's mother from Receiving that punishment, Akosia is sent to go and serve in the shrine as atonement for the sin that her mother has committed. So most of the times, the young girls who are sent to go and live in the shrine to serve as trogoses are not the offenders. Rather, they are being used as a means of payment for the offense of others. In trogosy, the girls serve the shrine for the rest of their lives. Once you become a trokosi, you are seen as the wife of the deity. And as the wife of the deity, you are responsible for every economic activity and all domestic services that go on in the shrine. So these young girls are responsible for cleaning, for washing, 
for cooking, every other domestic activity. They are also used economically to perform certain economic activities like farming, weaving, trading, all of that. Any activity that goes on in the shrine is performed by these women. Because the woman is seen as the wife of the deity, and the deity has his spokesperson who is the priest. The priest performs for the woman the husband responsibilities that the deity would have performed for her. This means that when a girl is sent to the shrine to live as the trokosi, she automatically becomes the wife of the priest. No other man has the right to marry her or to have any sexual intimacy with her apart from the priest. Some of these women, some of these girls are sexually abused. They are domestically exploited, they are economically exploited, and they go through a lot of difficulties. Chokosi's system is seen as a negative cultural practice and was abolished in the year 1988 by human rights activists because it's infringed on the rights of the young girls. Their rights to education is curtailed, their rights to the choice of a husband is curtailed, their right over their own sexuality and reproductive system is curtailed. They don't have a life of their own anymore. So there were advocacies and then it was abolished. Even though it's, it's been abolished since 1988, it continues to prevail in some traditional societies, even up to date. The next one is female genital mutilation. According to WHO 1995, Female genital mutilation is the partly or total removal of external female genitalia and injury to the female genital organs for cultural or other non therapeutic reasons. Now, in a female genital mutilation can be ref is also referred to as female circumcision or female genital cutting. What happens is that in female genital mutilation, the reproductive system of the woman especially her female genital area, specifically the clitoris, is removed or cut off for cultural purposes. This particular practice is not just practiced in Africa or cannot only be found in Africa, but it can be found in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, in Europe, in North America, among some immigrants in Australia. In Ghana specifically, it is practiced by the Nankani and then the Kusasi in the Upper East region. There were reasons for the performance of female genital mutilation. The first is that it was performed as a means of rite of passage. So it was performed to transit the woman from childhood to adulthood. So it was a rite of passage. It was also performed to decrease the libido of women to ensure that they remain faithful to their spouses once they are of uh, marriage age and get married. The belief is that the clitoris area of the woman is responsible for her, emo her sexual emotions or arousal. So once the clitoris is cut off, she, is, she does not get to experience any sexual arousal. And so she's not tempted to have an affair with another man, leading to her fidelity to her husband once she is married. But female genital mutilation posed some difficulties to the women, especially young girls who went through the process. The first is that there was difficulty in urinating, especially when it was freshly cut and the wound had to heal. And forgetting that apart from the clitoris being a means of sexual arousal for a woman, it performed other functions for her. So the cutting of it away affects that function or that role that it is supposed to perform for her. So women experience difficulty in urinating. Some went infertile, some became infertile, especially in situations where the person who performed the cutting did not do it well. Some women ended up being infertile. Also had some physical, mental and psychological consequences on the young girls. Some were emotionally traumatized, psychologically traumatized, and some were even afraid of sex in the long run. So as the years progressed, there were advocacies that the female genital mutilation should be abolished, and indeed, it's been abolished in Africa. 
The next negative cultural practice is widowhood rights. Widowhood rights is performed on the death of a deceased to protect either the man or the woman from the spirits of the dead. Now, there is the belief that once people get married and lived together, they have formed connections and bonds. So after death, these connections have to be broken. If the connections are not broken, there is the possibility that the woman or the living spouse will be hunted by the dead spouse. Widowhood rights is performed or was performed for both men and women, but most of the time, the women were the victims. This may be because most men were dying and leaving their wives as widows more than men, more than women dying and leaving their husbands as widowers. It involves a series of practices. Women were confined in a room for days. Some were denied food for a number of days. In some societies, the woman is allowed to sleep in a room alone with the body of her deceased spouse for several days and even weeks. Some of them were made to drink certain concoctions made from certain herbs that they have no idea where it came from. In some instances, after the body of the deceased spouse has been washed, the women were made to drink the water from the body of the deceased spouse. Some were paraded on the streets of their communities naked in public ridicule, and it caught so much dehumanization to the women. So some scholars and some human activists argued that the practice in itself is losing its essence because it has become a means where some family members take revenge on the spouses of either their deceased brother or their deceased son for whatever reason. The practice was dehumanizing to the women their sense of integrity, some of them lost their sense of integrity. The concoctions they were made to drink also posed some harmful uh, health hazards to them. Others were stigmatized and it really affected the health and the well-being of women. So there were advocacies that it should be abolished. The next negative cultural practice is child marriage. According to UNICEF, child marriage refers to any marriage before the age of 18 years. It can be either marriage by a boy or a girl. Just that the predominant one is the marriage of young girls before the age of 18. Child marriage takes various forms in Africa. In Northeast Ethiopia, for instance, there is a system called Telifa, which is seen as a form of child marriage. In Talifa, what happens is that a man who sees a young girl that he's interested in kidnaps the girl, abuses her sexually, and then when she gets pregnant, he approaches the family of the girl, informs them about the state of the girl, and then tells them that he is responsible for the pregnancy of the girl. He then uses the pregnancy as a bait to compel the girl's family to allow him to marry the girl. So this was usually done by men who spend their own self-assessment could not be accepted by the family of the girl. So they use this means to compel the girl's family to accept his marriage to the girl. Some scholars have also argued that trochosis system is also another form of child marriage. This is child marriage occurred for various reasons. The first is that it was as a result of poverty. In situations where families did not have the financial capacity to take care of their young girls, they married them off early, especially if the man happens to be a wealthy person who they were sure was going to take care of the child. After all, they don't have the means to care for the, the young girl, but the man will, will have the means to care for the young girl. And in some situations, it even extends to the other family members of the young girl. So poverty caused some families to give in their young girls to marriage. Another reason is that child marriage was seen as a way of alleviating families of the burden of taking care of a young girl or bearing the responsibility of taking care of a young girl. You know, the raising and then the training of, a, of girls are different from that of boys. 
training a girl is very demanding. You need to make sure that she's domestically well trained. She can do domestic work. When she's growing and she reaches adolescence, you need to make sure that you police her so well that she doesn't end up uh, associating with bad company or getting involved sexually with boys at an early age. Besides, in traditional societies, the ultimate goal for women was to get married. And so the, the burden of having to take care of a child for about 18 or 19 years to ensure that she's well trained and brought up before you eventually give her out in marriage was taking off parents when they gave the girls out in marriage at a younger age. After all, the end result for a woman at the time was to end up getting married. So why not do it at an earlier stage? It was also seen as a means of accruing wealth for families. The payments of bride wealth served as a means of capital for families to build themselves up economically. Some families were also encouraged or motivated by the payments of bride wealth to give in their young girls in marriage. But human rights activists argued that child marriage infringed on the rights of girls. When a girl is given into marriage at a young age below 18, her right to education is off. Her dreams and aspirations to become whoever she wants to become will no longer be there. She doesn't have any rights over her reproductive system. She becomes a mother at the age she's not ready or prepared for it. And the woman has no rights over her life. And so human activists argued that child marriage should be abolished. The next one is expensive funeral. Funerals in itself is not a negative cultural practice, but the expensive nature of funerals has now become a challenge that hinders the development of society. Traditionally, the belief is that when a person dies or passes on, the belief is that the person moves from the land of the living to the land of the dead. And in Africa, there is a belief that even after death, there is still life. And so during the funeral ceremony, certain rituals and ceremonies are performed to transition the person from the land of the living smoothly to the land of the dead. But in recent years, the expensive nature of funerals is hindering the development of societies. People are spending so much on food, on drinks, on music, on attires, and a lot of expenditures that only garnishes the funeral ceremony. Resources that can be geared towards the advancement of members of the family, building their capacities, paying their school fees, investing into the education of the young people in the family, are being invested into funeral ceremonies just to garnish the funeral ceremony and make it become more lively than it's traditionally intended to. The last one is belief in witchcraft. Witchcraft as a belief has prevailed in Africa over the years and it continues to exist. It is used as a means to explain unexplainable events, misfortunes, disasters, when things happen and we do not get an explanation to why or how it happened. The last resort is that it is attributed to witchcraft. And sometimes when we attribute it to witchcraft, there is a sense of fulfillment that an answer has been gotten for whatever misfortune that has happened. The belief in witchcraft is usually as a result of rumors. People are not able to prove it, but people are accused and when they are accused, they are stigmatized in society. Some are lynched to death, some are ridiculed, and it's affected a lot of women. Witchcraft's belief has a gender dimension. Most of the time, it is women who are seen as witches. When a woman becomes successful in society, she's branded as a witch. And this discourages women from progressing highly in whatever economic activity they were involved in for fear of being branded as a witch. There were also the generational dimension where older women are seen as witches rather than the younger people. In the northern part of Ghana, there is the Gambaga witch camp where it is believed or women, people accused of being witches are isolated and kept there 
with the idea that they won't have access to their family members and to negatively impact on them. These women are isolated from their families, they are confined, and their human rights are curtailed. So in all, you can see that in the discussion of the negative cultural practices, the basic reason why these cultural practices are tagged as negative is that they infringe on the human rights of the individuals it's affected. And for that reason, human rights activists and advocates advocated for its abolishment in societies where they were practiced, especially in Africa. Thank you.